messed it up, I'll just, I'll just get away. I'll just put it in a national park. I'll put it in a wilderness area. I'll, I'll lock it up so people can't go there and mess it up. <coughs> and you know what? I get that. I understand it. All right? But I think that's the wrong approach. I call that environmentalism by abandonment. Because the fact is, the more that we know now, I mean, all this new archaeological, anthropo anthropological stuff, we now know, I mean, Bandana Sheevan last night was talking right here on this stage about, you know, we now know that Australia, this was, there, there was no wilderness here. This was a garden, a very carefully managed, manipulated garden by the Aborigines with a lot of elder wisdom behind where we burn, where we go, what we eat, how we live on the land. And, and they did a pretty decent job in 1820. Uh, Dr. Christine Jones tells us in 1820, um, uh, we now know that Australia averaged 20% organic matter in the soil. 20% organic matter. When you realize that one pound of organic matter holds four pounds of water, and that Australia has now gone to an average of less than 1% organic matter, you start to quickly see that there is an X exponential, astronomical uh, um, decline in water retentive capacity. It's not just how fast the insoak can go, it's how much total water can insoak. And so what I encourage is environmental, is participatory environmentalism. <laughs> Where I look in the mirror and I say, okay, so why do I have this big brain and these opposing thumbs? You know, monkeys can't do that. You know, that, that. That's mechanical ability, okay? All right? So, so why have I been endowed with the blessing of this big brain and opposing thumb? Is it so I can become the most efficient conquistador, pillager, rapist on the planet? Or is it just possible, is it just possible that I was meant to leverage this to be a gardener, to be a masseuse of our ecological womb? To actually caress, not that the planet is some sort of a, a, a reluctant partner. I'm gonna, gonna force you, make you to grow to me, I'm gonna wrestle with this thing. No, rather, the earth is a benevolent partner, a lover that responds to a, cre a caress just like our human lover and will respond abundantly and in kind. And I suggest that's the kind of relationship that we, that we can cultivate. We now have the information, the technology, the infrastructure, the ability. I almost feel like the, the whole petroleum thing was almost like nature blessing us with, a, with, a, with a, a, a cheap energy thing, one last big you know effort. Look, folks, I'm going to give you cheap energy. Now, you can... You can remediate all the damage through hydration. That's what I like about permaculture. You know, permaculture is so cool because it dares to suggest you can participate as a friend. And that, and that every, every ravine, every valley, every piece of terrain is not necessarily in its best position. And we can come in with a track loader and we can build a pond on high ground and, and hydrate the landscape and, and we can touch that ground in a, in a sensitive way to actually tease out more solar energy converted into biomass. When we lock up the land and don't allow this, this human uh, uh, participation in it, we also lock out human creativity to be able to massage it in a healing way. But instead of using all that petroleum to remediate in a generation all of the degradation humankind had done throughout history, we created a food system that, um, that became, where the average morsel of food became dependent on traveling 1,500 miles, and where uh, it takes 14 calories of energy to put one calorie on our plate. And so we squandered it. We're maybe close to you know, not being able to remediate that, but I don't think so. I think we need to try. So, um, so using the pigs here to tease out uh, abundance is very, very powerful. 
Uh, this is a neighbor's place that we rented. We run pigs there. So here you are. The pigs have now vacated. Here's, uh, here's about uh, five days after the pigs have vacated. Okay, you saw what it looked like. Here you go. All right, there's five days. There's 20 days. Look at that recuperation. It's gorgeous. Okay, it's gorgeous. And the reason is because the disturbance excited a germination of latent seeds. Many of these seeds, our, our, our forage specialists don't even know what some of these are. We are awakening 500,000 year old seed banks here by bringing the germination through. See, used to be, used to be that buffalo ran through there and there was tip there was fire that came through and all these disturbance, these short-term disturbance factors created a successional vegetation position. Today, now that we've locked out fire, locked out the animals, locked out the periodic disturbances, the ecosystem becomes very static, sterile, stale, and actually goes backwards. Now what happens is it takes a while for it to go backwards, but you can see how here how quickly it can, it can uh, go forward with uh, good strategic uh, management. All right, I call this my biological cathedral. Now, in the, then when the pigs are done in the pig pastures, they can go into the trees nearby, and the trees, of course, um, uh, have, have all sorts of bugs and caterpillars and things that affect the trees in the, in the uh, understory, and so the pigs go through, um, and, and we just use nylon rope here. This is a nylon rope, see, we tie it around the tree, and make another loop to run our electric, our electric fence. See the electric fence is running through this loop, and we can just zigzag this from tree to tree, and in no time at all, we can enclose five, six acres, put these pigs in, the pigs then go through, uh, clean out the understory, they eat the, the, the bugs and, the, and the, the worms and things that would hurt the trees, and they stimulate the duff into the soil, stimulate a, a late seed bank under the trees and grow a second understory under the trees. So now instead of just having vegetation up there and leaves underneath, now you have leaves up there and this entire exploding understory of released vegetation underneath the tree so we have two canopies of leaves and you actually have much more protection on the soil and much more biomass produced and here's what's really cool that forest that forest is generating five hundred dollars an acre while it's growing healthy trees so you know this should be done in every state park Every wilderness area, every national park, the fact is there is not one single reason for one single confinement hog house anywhere on the planet. That's the truth. There is so much land. I mean, in the U.S., we've got the mesquite in Texas, the pinion pine in Colorado. We've got, we've got millions of acres. I mean, uh, you know, when Governor Tim Kaine came to visit, you know, and, and he saw this and he really, you know, uh, understood he was an environmentalist. And uh, he was executive director of the Virginia like Sierra Club or something for a few years. And he really got this. And he said, so how can I help you? I said, well, Governor, uh, how about schedule a meeting down at the governor's mansion next week? And we'll talk about polyface leasing all the state parks so we can save the oak tree with pigs. And he just laughed. Because if he did that, the environmentalists would go berserk. Okay? Because you can't participate with nature. You have to get away and not desecrate it with human breath. <laughs> and so I am the first to repent in sackcloth and ashes for the abuse that my ancestors have done. I get that. But the answer is not to go crawl in a hole and say, okay, okay, you know, let's just let's just eat tofu and petroleum and you know <laughs> get away from it. The answer is to actually actively participate with the technology we got. I mean, with electric fencing now, I mean, we now have the technology to be able to do this on a very, very grand scale. <laughs> very, very cheap. And you notice, I've gone through this whole pig thing. Where's all the money? Where's the concrete? Where's the big, in it's not there. I mean, you can take all the infrastructure, put it in the back of your ute, and go down the road and duplicate it somewhere else. You know, it, it doesn't dominate the landscape. All right. Grasslands. All right. Grass is the most efficacious 
solar energy converter to biomass that there is. It's more efficacious than trees and shrubs. Grass is number one, and that's why all the great soils of the world were built with megafauna and perennial grasslands. And so uh, we don't have the buffalo anymore. We don't have the elk where we are. What we do have is a third cousin called the cow. And so the herbivore is essentially a pruner of the biomass, so that as the biomass grows up and turns into senescence, just like an orchardist would prune an orchard, or a vineyardist would prune a grapevine to, to, to stimulate new vegetative, fresh growth, the herbivore prunes the biomass back to restart the rapid juvenile growth curve of that plant and stimulate more solar energy. So the whole point of the herbivore is to be managed. We don't have the large migratory herds anymore. How are you going to, how are you going to duplicate this, this disturbance pruning rest cycle that we see in large migratory herds? How are you going to do that when we have private ownership of land? How are we going to duplicate migration on my 100 acre place? or my five acre place. How are we gonna do that? We do it with electric fence. Again, this is the technological aha that enables us for the first time in human history to be, able to, to be able to duplicate on a very small domestic scale the massive migratory patterns of nature. So we can manage that pruner to place that pruner in the right spot at the right time for the right amount of time and move them on to another spot. So the electric fence is our, our brake, our steering wheel, and our accelerator on that four-legged pruning <laughs> sauerkraut back. Okay? <laughs> the cow. Or the <clears throat> so we have a network of permanent fence, and then think about the permanent fence being the stringers of a ladder and then the rungs as being temporary. So we can move those rungs around depending on when they come in. And yes, this is completely scalable. You know, it's so funny. Um, when I started doing this 30 years ago, you know, the, 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 we, were, we were much, much smaller than we are now. And, um, and people would always come up to me and say, oh, that's all sweet and cool. You know, our first Eggmobile was a little, you know, a little uh, uh, six by eight. Uh, that I that I on bicycle wheels, I pushed it around the field, you know, with 50 chickens in it, and um, and now we have 4,000 layers and you know 12 eggmobiles that are great big. She does a minute, but the, the point is, people ask, oh, that's very cute, but how do you how do you scale it up? Today, I do one of these things, and the typical question is, that's amazing. How do you scale it down? I mean, you can't win for losing. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of this is, that, here's the deal. The beauty of this is that the equity here. I go through this, I want you to understand the equity is not in infrastructure. The equity is in management and information. And in management and information, you don't have to borrow money to get. Okay? And it's portable. Your management and your information, fortunately, you know, unless you're disembodied, they go with you wherever you go. Okay? And so if you have five acres and two cows or 10 sheep, the same principles apply. Yes, you're going to go out and you're going to give them one day's plateful, one day's menu. And you're going to know how much that is because you're going to step it off. One, two, three, four, five. And you're, okay, today I gave them... 50 square yards. Tomorrow when you come out, ooh, I didn't give them quite enough. They act a little bit unhappy. They grazed it too hard. How are you going to know to give them 10% more if you don't know what you gave them yesterday? All right? So this is one of the things that we drill into our interns and you know, apprentices. If you're moving cows and I come and ask you, how many cow equivalents do you have? So we move everything into a cow equivalent. We've got a mixed herd. It all comes to a constant of animal. If you've got cows, calves, little calves, sheep, whatever, all in a mixed group, you come up with a, 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 a common. You know, uh, holistic management usually uses animal units 
We like cow days because it's easier to say than animal units. So that's like four syllables. Cow days is two syllables. <laughs> so, and, and we're in cows, so.